the sooner, the sooner you form a company, the less likely you run into to legal costs, tax complications, um, and you begin to protect the IP, and you also begin to legislate the relationship between you and your founders. Right. Um, so what kind of equity? What should we form? What are we talking about? Everyone talks about an LLC and thinks it's the cheaper, easier, faster method, right? Have you guys seen that? Have you thought about forming a company and done the research on whether it's a C Corp or an LLC? A lot of learning out there, right? Everyone talks about LLC and, and about you know, avoiding the double taxation and, and that it's better. But what we've really found for, for really 98% of the companies that we deal with, the emerging company um, you know, track, they're going to form, they're going to be financed by institutional investors and outside investors, they will grow, they will use um, the company's equity as compensation in the form of options usually or restricted stock. We find for those types of companies, the gold standard is really the corporation. And it's for a lot of different reasons. But, you know, when we talk about I don't know if you're going to be able to see. This is kind of an advantage. It's a little bit better if it's, if it's formatted right. But when we talk about the LLCs, right, what we find is, is that a lot of the, the, the benefit that we think is the LLC, right, is that it's cheaper. It's, it's not often cheaper um, because the flexibility that's allowed with an LLC allows people to negotiate rights. And you have this omnibus agreement that changes over time and becomes more complicated. Um, with respect to incentivize employees, um, the LLC has what's called a profits interest, and that's a future interest in the profits of the company. A C Corp can, can issue a, a capital interest in the form of an option and has a strike price. The market understands options. They know that. They don't understand profits interests, and it's a little bit of a different economic uh, value to the holder. So, you know, we see that, that, that companies that are looking to incentivize employees with option pools and C Corps much better off. Right. On the flip side, this idea that we can avoid double tax, right, or that we can, um, you know, use some of the losses that the LLC is going to incur, um, I never really see the founders benefit from that. Or, you know, most of the time they don't benefit from, from the tax advantages because they don't have other losses or gains inside of the other part of their portfolio to offset losses here, right, and or, um, <coughs> you will eventually convert, you know, if there's an institutional investor, like a venture capital fund, they will ask you to convert to a C Corp for usually a regulatory reason. It's called ERISA, so, um, and they'll want a blocker corp in, in, beneath you, so, um, or above you and beneath them, so that you, you, you'll find that you'll convert anyway, and you will have spent a lot of money and costs in actually managing this LLC. You'll have these profits interests that your employees won't understand as much, and you wouldn't have gotten the tax benefit by the time you actually do convert. So, you know, for, for most of the companies that, that we work with, um, the C Corp is the better option. There are exceptions, right? If you are going to develop a lot of IP and the founder is going to infuse a lot of money of her own money into the company in order to be able to, to fund that intellectual property development, um, and may have other gains in their, in their portfolio and can use those losses. That's a great reason to do it. Um, if it's really kind of a family business, not going to morph, not going to have, you know, employees or be institutionally backed, you know, an LLC is, is probably a great option for you or an S Corp is potentially an option for you in, in that case as well, right? If you're going to hold real estate, you're going to do it as an LLC. And those are, you know, every company is different. Um, and I'm really talking about, you know, the majority of the companies, um, but those are the main points that you should consider. I think there was a question back there first, right? I was just going to ask if these slides are going to be available anywhere. Right. And so I don't know if this is until we can reformat it, but, but um, you can contact uh, Haley and me and we can send you the deck. Yeah, I can hear you. Is the question that can you use? Like uh, because uh, for C corporation, right? You can use uh, uh, is your equity to. Uh, right, you can use your equity in an LLC, but it's different, right? It's a profits interest. So the, when I issue to it, so for example, um, you're going to come on as my chief marketing officer at Nuco um, LLC, right? And so the company now is worth three million dollars. 
I'm going to offer you 2% profits interest. What that means is that, is that over and above 3 million, right, you will get 2% of a profits interest. You get 2% of the profits above when you join, right, as opposed to if it were an option, the, the delta, the value of the company would be actually reflected in an exercise price for an option. Right, and you'd exercise that and go forward. So here, the profits interest upon issuance for tax reasons really has zero value and zero capital account. You could use it. My point is, is that it's more complicated to do so, and the market doesn't understand it as bad as much as they do understand options. Right? If you go downstairs, everyone will tell you what an option is and how to strike price, and they'll talk about 409A and, and that stuff. Right? But I think the treatment with respect to profits interest isn't so sure, and I know that founders Work, working cap charts and waterfalls on the cap chart often do that wrong because they don't treat profits interests um, the right way. They treat them as though that they were options and then just divide. If you have 2%, they'll divide you that as opposed to actually having tranches of distributions based on um, enterprise value upon issuance, right? So it's a more complicated method and um, the market doesn't understand it, but you can do that and people do do that. At scale, it's a bear. Right, because now you're getting, imagine, imagine that I'm an LLC with 100 employees. As an LLC, right, every member of the LLC, every interest holder is a member, and they all have a right to see the agreement. They all have a right to receive K-1s. So imagine you know, giving someone a 0.2% profits interest in an LLC, and you gotta issue them a K-1 every year, and they have to see your agreement. And that's kind of why a lot of founders even will move away from the, from the LLC structure uh, because that gets complicated and onerous, right? And, and when you talk about it relative to the value, right, if you're really gaining the value and you're, you're gaining a better tax treatment and you're using those losses, you're going to be able to stay in LLC through sale, then great, that's worth it. But most of the time it just doesn't happen. Right. I, so I don't know what a lot means, um, you know, and there's consistent reporting with respect to C-Corps and LLC just in terms of like annual statements that you file in Delaware. To be honest with you, most of, uh, of, uh, of the clients I work with, we have to remind them to do that. <laughs> like, you know, and some of them miss it and, and are late. But these aren't onerous reporting requirements until you're a public company. That's a different sort of reporting requirement. So the basic stuff for an LLC and a C-Corp is often really the same. You're not gonna, you're not gonna reveal any more or less information than, than you would in one way or another. Um, going along with that, aren't there like board meetings that have to be reported? Yeah, that's kind of a... Right, so, so you, you have to have a board in, in a C-Corp, um, and usually an early stage C-Corp is the board is, you know, if it's one founder, that's the board. Um, and uh, you know, you should take minutes and you should do that, but you know, if, if you have board authorizations, you're working as one. But a C-Corp also allows you to, if it's a Delaware C, allows you to actually, you know, sort of meet by, or take action by written consent. Um, and there's these other metrics that are baked into the law that are default, and we just rely on that. So you can do a written consent in, in, as opposed to having a meeting every time, right? And the concept of meeting, by the way, um, I think that's a good thing. If you have a board, you should meet, and it shouldn't be something you don't want to do because the board should be providing a ton of value to you to help you grow that company, and it's not something you should be afraid of and like sort of move away. Um, that's part of growing the business, meeting, thinking about the business with other folks and doing that. So, you know, and, and if you have an investor in LLC, they might require you to meet anyway. You can have a board. Most of the LLCs that we set up will have a board of managers, and so we make the thing look like a C-Corp in a lot of different ways. Right, but for tax. And so you come up with these same sort of regulations and rules, except that you're dealing with other mechanics on the tax side. Uh, if you get a C Corp like in Delaware and operate in New York, do you have to apply for front end in New York? For for yeah, you have for an LLC you do too. Right, so any, any company that is doing business in New York, if it's not formed in New York, has to file as a foreign company that's doing in New York, right? It's an authorization to do business. Whether it's an LLC or a C Corp, you have to file that. The LLC has an additional filing requirement which is in New York, which is a pain, right? You need to actually publish the existence of the LLC, whether you form here or, or come here from Delaware to do business, you need to publish that in a newspaper and that's actually an additional cost where the C Corp is is, is cheaper to, to, to form.
um, because you've got to publish it into new, two newspapers. If you're in New York County, the county clerk has designated the Law Journal as one of them, and that's actually really, really expensive. It's the most expensive you know, sort of spot to take out, and so you have to do that in compliance. So it's a little bit more for an LLC on that. Um, and then the other arrangements as you start to draft them become more too. B Corp is, is, is essentially a C Corp with um, extra, you know, or sort of relaxed limitations on fiduciary duties to be able to actually have social impact. Uh, to be honest with you, I think I've formed one. We don't see it that often. We don't really recommend it. The comp any C Corp can do a lot of the sa those same things um, that a B Corp can with the right incentive to do so. Um, so, yeah, we stay away from it. From our perspective, the company that you're forming is going to grow and is likely to bring on employees and investors. The easier that it is for them to understand what you've done and that progression, the easier it is for them to invest. Right? They shouldn't be scratching their heads thinking about your structure or getting smart on a B Corp. Right? Not everyone knows about it, they've heard about it. Some investors will call us up and say, look, this company's a B Corp, I'm not so sure. Should we have them switch and all of those other things? Those conversations happen. You know, as a founder, looking to, to bring on capital, the best thing you can do is remove from any conversation any of these, these ancillary discussions because they're not going to be meaningful. They're not going to create a whole lot of value. They're just going to sort of be a distraction. It's a C Corp, um, you know, it, unless, we've, unless it's one of those exceptions that, that we've talked about. Right, let's see. <coughs> S Corp, worth a couple, couple of uh, sentences or, uh, on this. S Corp is essentially a combination of C Corp and LLC, um, although S Corp actually predated LLC in most states. Um, and it looks and feels like a C Corp. The, the variation is that you can't have, you can only have up to 75 investors, there's no institutional investors, there's no foreign investors. Any one of those things blows your election and, you, and, and you're back to a, a C Corp status. So sometimes companies will start with this because it looks and feels the same way as a C Corp and it gives them that tax treatment, and then they decide, look, once we do our round, if we do a round with an institutional investor, status blown, that's okay, we're now a C Corp and we go forward. Um, and some of them make that decision. Other, others, you know, decide, hey, it's a family-run business, it's gonna be really closely held, I'm never gonna have foreign investors, I'm never gonna hit 75, but I like the look and feel of a C Corp, right? It feels good. I've known that before. I've done. I've been in corporations before. So why don't I just do this S corp and 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 do it that way? And it, and that's perfectly fine too, right? So the, the takeaway from all of this is that each of these entities is an incredibly useful tool, right? The most flexibility you get is with the LLC. You can really sort of mix and match different classes of stock and rights and and do all sorts of things. But with that flexibility comes the idea that you have to actually draft that. Right? It's just not a default. It's not sitting there back in Delaware law, like corporate law. Oh, I can go rely on this code section of DGCL. Oh, I can rely on this section. Right? It's still a very young body of law. Most LLCs only started in 95 to like 97, 98, right? So, and they continue to be formed through, to, states continue to adopt LLC statutes through the early 2000s. So, you know, you have about, you know, 10 to 15 years of of legislative and, and legal history developing LLC law as opposed to hundreds of years on the C Corp and, and Delaware with such a robust chance record is great with that. So the predictability of, uh, and predictability is really important to investors. Predictability is so much uh, more with the C Corp for them. Right, this is some of the things we talked about right before. Um, VCs won't or can't invest in the LLCs. The investors prefer the simplicity of owning stock, not complications of K1s, right? So if I'm Kleiner Perkins and I have 100 different portfolio companies, imagine if they're all LLCs and they're all a tax year giving me K1s, right? That's a hard thing for them to administer. In addition to whatever regulatory concern is, they don't want those things. Now, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't form that way, but if you're thinking about venture money, and you may convert, then you gotta put that into your analysis. If I'm converting within two years, is it really beneficial to be an LLC at first, right? Right, and this is what we talked about before, right, the ability to grant um, equity to service providers. You have it in all of those. But just, there's one clear, understandable context, and that's, that's the option for everyone else. 
Transaction costs, um, you know, anecdotally, they're, they're probably at least 25% less in, in, in C Corps than, than LLCs over the course of time. So if that, is del if that delta actually is better for you on a tax purpose, that helps drive your analysis because you're gonna spend more on the transaction costs throughout the time, right? And then just familiarity, something we, we talked about before, um, investors and everyone else are familiar with C Corps, right? And so then the question is where it should be organized, right? A uh, client came to me last week with a Nevada C Corp. I've dealt with, with, uh, with clients um, who had Texas corporations, right? And, and, you know, of course in New York, everyone, you know, a lot, lots of folks will start with a New York corporation or an LLC. Um, but Delaware happens to be, again, you know, kind of the gold standard. Why is that? Uh, it's just a well far developed body of law than any other state. It is more director and officer friendly than most states. Nevada could be a little bit more director and officer friendly, but there are secrecy laws about in Nevada that investors actually get scared about. And so, I, you know, every investor I've worked with and looking at a Nevada Corp, they're like, convert that to Delaware C right now in terms of the investment. And so, you know, and Texas, what I found is actually has some really good features for startups, but then if you look at their, their, their merger and acquisition standards, hefty approval standards, more so than Delaware, that makes it harder for the company on an exit event. And you want to look ahead to that because these are things that ought to be easy and simple, right? And so lawyers know Delaware. We know what the standards are. Um, again, you know, why, that's why using Delaware. Why have anyone question you about the state that you've picked um, when there's no downside to using Delaware? Right. It says our activities need to mostly be in New York. Right. So that's There's a critical difference between where you incorporate and where you do business. Right. I'd imagine that 98% of 99% of the companies that are incorporated or formed in Delaware do not actually do business in Delaware. They're doing business elsewhere. And then someone had mentioned before about an authority to do business. So what you would do is you file the authority to do business in New York. And as long as you're doing business there, like the Economic Development Corps, like the, like the NYEDC, NJDEDC have location requirements, right? Are you here? Is there a team here? It's not where you're incorporated. It's just where, the, where is the team and where are you? Because they don't really care as much as that. What they want to do is find jobs, right? So if there's jobs here, they'll be okay, right? Yeah, and then there are your other options, right? Um, again, the, the why be different comment is something that's going to bleed into this. Um, so before we get into the, 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 the financing, um, and I get, get apologize, this, the, whole, the whole sort of format is off. Before we get into financing, um, I wanted to just take a step. So we're forming in Delaware. It's a C-Corp. Um, one of the first things that you want to do when you form that C-Corp is, is the discussion among founders. Right, how many founders are you? How is that equity allocated? Something we started talking about before. Uh, and I think it's really important, right? Form the company, allocate the equity, and then if there's more than one of you, make sure, make sure that you have a vesting arrangement. Some mechanism to say, hey, right, you and I are in this together, but if you're not in this with me, then what happens to that stock, right? What happens if we start today at 50-50 and you leave tomorrow? Now, am I a 50% holder that's going to create value for you and you're going to keep your stock and do nothing? Or do I have to shut down the company? These are questions we get all the time. And it, it always starts with, yeah, we were friends and like, you know, we had an arrangement and that was fine and it's kind of understood. It always ends with, that's not what we talked about and that's not what we understood and, and now we have to buy someone out or, or create some way of, of making sure this company can move on. Because no company with a significant or material amount of, of, of dead stock, right, stock that was supposed to be for a service provider that's no longer providing services to the company is going to survive. It needs that, it needs that equity to actually compensate those service providers and move on. So an arrangement that says, look, we're going to share this amount, but we're gonna invest, and if one of us leaves early, some of this equity gets retained by the company is, is highly recommended. Um, and we make sure we do it with almost every one of our companies. Now, if it's a sole founder, 
right? You don't have to do that. An investor may ask you to do that later, right? Under the concept of, look, I'm gonna put $2 million into your company, right? Same concept, I don't want you to leave tomorrow, so I wanna tie you up. I want you to be more committed to the company. I want you to have more skin in the game, and so I want you to invest into some more equity. And that may happen over time as well. But those are you know, important things to consider as you're starting the company, right? Form it, Delaware C Corp, reverse vesting, vesting it for arrangements for the founders, um, incredibly important. And then the, the other critical uh, thing to think about at this stage is, is to make sure that all of the founders who are working on the IP, IP goes into the company, right? The company's a big box, we're working on the IP out here, IP goes in here, I get my stock. Right, I want to make sure that the company retains all of the value and all of the assets. Right, that's what makes it valuable and important. That's what lets it grow, and that's what investors will look at. The sooner you do that and you start off, the better you are. We incur a lot of legal costs, or companies incur a lot of legal costs with us on fixing stuff because you didn't do it first. It's like you know, if you ever watch, you know, there's a few of us of a vintage, you know, Woody Woodpecker, right? Like you know, because if Woody would have went straight to the police, this would have never happened. Right, so that's the concept here. You know, you do it right the first way and, and you're gonna actually save a lot of time and money and, and, uh, and heartache in the future. Um, okay, so that's about formation. Any questions about that? And I wanna move on to the, to the next part, which is you know, actually getting some capital into the company. How long does the formation take for a suit? So you can file the certificate of incorporation. You know, we could draft one and file it you know, today, right? <laughs> that's simple. Um, the other arrangements around that are, are, are what take more time. You know, generally it shouldn't take more than a week or two weeks to get all of those two weeks to get all of those arrangements set. Um, the faster, if all of the founders are set about how they want to proceed, then then that that process moves faster. Sometimes um, they haven't talked about it, and you know, if we're adding into this concept that we have to talk about this and socialize who owns what and how that works then it could be longer, right? But the process itself and the filing and drafting the documents, it doesn't take a long time. So if you form a Delaware and they sue, does that lawsuit happen in Delaware or does it happen in a state that they sue you? <laughs> so so you're, you're, the jurisdictional analysis is gonna be a little bit more complicated than that, but they can, they, can, they can sue you in Delaware, they could sue you probably in the state where you're doing, you can sue you in the state where you're doing business, they might be able to sue you in other states too, depending upon jurisdictional analysis. Um, what happens a lot, though, is what you will negotiate contractually a forum for the dispute. So, for example, right, you're a Delaware C Corp, you're entering into an agreement with um, another Delaware C Corp, but you're both in New York, right? And you have some IP development agreement, and the clause at the back of the agreement says dispute resolution. We agree that this contract will be governed by, and you could pick Delaware law or New York law, right? Because Delaware law is going to govern the, the company itself, but it doesn't necessarily have to govern the contract, right? And that contract can be governed by New York or Delaware. You may you have different choices depending on what your counsel says. But, you know, in either of those choices, you could say, we want this to be heard in New York. Two parties in New York, New York courts are very good at that, and there's a you know, commercial division uh, at the Supreme Court that can do that. And so a lot of our clients, We'll choose, you know, New York law, New York forum um, on, on some of those things. But you can mix and match this depending upon where you are, where the counterparty is, and it's often a part of negotiation. Right. Great. So, so now financing. All right, we've gotten the company set up, and and usually founders will set it up with very minimal amount of money. Right, it's going to be some 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 nominal amount, a hundred bucks each or whatever that is. Um, but now we're coming to the concept of, you know, we need to do a round, an equity round. Um, and at the early stage, you know, you have a number of different options. There are two options that I wanted to spend some time about and talk about today um, for financing. And the first is, is it's called the convertible note financing. Um, and have you heard, raise your hand, have you heard of the convertible note financing? Right, okay. So, so I'll go back and explain a little bit about how it works. All right. Um, when the founders start the company, they're going to buy stock at a nominal price, right? And it's a really simple transaction. If I buy, you know, 100 shares for a dollar, I get, you know, I give the company a dollar, I get 100 shares back. Um, you can finance a company in that way too, at, you know, a million or two million shares. Um, but one neat way to actually finance a company at a very low cost and defer what is called a valuation event, right? And we'll get to that. 
is, is a convertible note financing. And so what this is, it's this debt instrument that says I'm debt now, but upon certain events, I am gonna convert and become equity in the company, right? And those events and they convert, how they convert or what, what make that the instrument um, you know, interesting because it'll convert different ways upon different events, right? Um, so we'll talk about that and we're also gonna compare that against the seed equity round um, and help you decide kind of which to choose, right? So again, sorry, this is, let's see if we can sort of do that. Okay, so simple un unsecured um, debts, right? And they convert into preferred stock, typically at a discount to the next round per share, right? So now if I have debt, I have not created a valuation event on the company. And what I'm saying is as a debt holder, I am gonna wait until you guys do a regular, like a, 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 a preferred seed round or a preferred stock round and at that point in time, when an investor has priced the company and said it's either five, 10, 50 million, I will convert my note into the stock that's issued in that round, okay? It's simple enough, right? So if I have $100,000 of debt and you're doing now a, a series seed preferred round a year after I take that debt from the company, right, my 100,000 converts into the series seed. But it's not fair if it just converts one for one at the same price, right? Because I'm not, I don't have any risk adjustment, right? It's, I have not gained anything for the year of runaway that I've given you for the $100,000, um, uh, you know, if you're gonna give me the same price that someone gets a year from now. So I'll negotiate a discount to that next round. And that discount or a cap to two different things will, will dictate the way and the amount it converts. And so often in the market, we'll say, look, if the price is a dollar, you note holder can, can convert at 80 cents and you get a 20% discount on your conversion. Another thought and you know, another way to, to, to deal with this investors negotiate is a cap. Okay, instead of the 20% discount, let's not talk about discounts. If your valuation is 10, 15, 20, I don't care, but if I'm converting, I'm gonna convert at a $5 million valuation, right? And so what that says is like, go ahead, get your runway, drive up the value as much as you can, but either way, I'm converting at $5 million valuation, right? And so then the, the other variable is, right? Investor will say, well, I kinda want either or, right? Because if 5 million isn't a 20% discount, I still want my 20% discount. So the way that the convertible notes now work is that the investor expects either a 20% discount or the price per share that would be derived with the valuation cap that they have, right? And so what happens is, is that the investors will get um, you know, their, their, their VIG, if you will, they get their upside when it converts at a later round and their upside is, is in the discount to the round. Now, what are the advantages and disadvantages of the structure? Um, well, one of the advantages is, is valuation. By using convertible note, valuation is deferred. What do I mean by that? Um, so if, if we start a company today and we get a term sheet tomorrow for um, you know, $1 million on a $3 million pre-money valuation. Now, all of a sudden, and we sign, we can kind of do the stock deal, the company has a pre-money valuation of three, you do the deal, it's a post-money valuation of $4 million. You have an option pool, right? What happens to that option pool? And those options and the strike prices that you issue to employees, it's no longer a penny or you know, .001 per share, right? It's actually a derivative of the, of the enterprise value. So if the enterprise value is now you know, $4 million and you have an option pool of, of, of uh, 400000 you have a $400,000 you know, pool, or 10% option pool, you have $400,000 of value that are encapsulated in the pool. And if you start issuing that, that value needs to be on the strike price. And now you're getting you know, these dollar, two, three dollar strike prices for a very early stage company that just formed. And so if you go to Mr. Employee, you know, employee number three, right, who says, and you say, look, I'm gonna give you restricted stock or options, and you say, okay, the value is X, and they were thinking, wow, I thought I was getting founder stock. 
as when I was getting a founder price. And what they mean, right, there's no such thing as that per se under Delaware law. What it means is that I'm getting the early, the early price and the very low strike price, right? And so what you've done, if you take on a financing early with a high valuation, you've priced your option pool. And you know, in New York and San Francisco, there's a lot of savvy uh, employees that are gonna be thinking about this increased uh, price in the option pool and you know, they don't want to pay that. They'd rather actually have the founder stock or the cheaper price. So now what the convertible note does, it says let's forget about this concept of one on a three, right? One million on a three million dollar pre-money valuation. Let's not talk about you know, what your valuation is today. Let's talk about what I would convert at in the future and to give you a runway. And so that's where that concept of a cap or a discount comes in. And it allows the company to, to defer the valuation to an equity round. So it's kind of the tool that a lot of startup companies will use and that's why the convertible promissory note is, 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 is you know, so in vogue. Um, it's also extremely easy to do and to issue um, which does create a lot of the problems that founders will have with them because they start using them like Pez. Right, oh, I have a note, you know, I have a note. And it's, you know, they just start issuing them out. And, you know, I call this my credit card problem, right? Because no one's doing the math to figure out when this converts and what the discount could be in the future. They're just really happy that I have a $50,000 check from an angel investor on a note. And so this starts, you know, to, to swipe the credit card, swipe the credit card, then you do the cap chart at the conversion and you start to look at the dilution, founders are often unaware of, of the dilution that's occurred vis-a-vis -vis converting these notes at a discount to um, the actual preferred stock price. Um, and that often happens. Um, right, and so other advantages or perceived advantages, and you can always have the flip, is that at a convertible promissory note round, it's a very early stage, it's very light. Investors don't ask for a lot of rights. They certainly don't ask for board rights. They don't, you know, they may ask for limited information rights. They may ask for the right to, to participate in the next round, but it's not often. And the company definitely gets to control those terms. As soon as you get into this concept of, of a preferred equity that's being issued, the investors, uh, first of all, it's, it's typically with a much higher investment amount, but the investors start to negotiate more rights. There's board rights, there's protective provisions, there's liquidation preferences. Um, all of those things come into play, it becomes a more complicated round, and then what you find is, is that the company is now, is now um, a little bit more under control at a very early stage with in investor oversight. Now that could be a great thing, but a lot of founders want a little bit more of a leeway at the beginning to actually sort of you know, idea eight before they get board involvement on, on other on, on other stuff. Right, so typical terms of the note. Um, the amount raised, right, so this isn't set in stone, but my personal metric, the inflection point is about 750. Before, if you're raising a round of 750 and, and, and below, you know, I, I, I tend to think that a, a promissory note is a helpful way to go about it. There's, there's other instruments that are out there now. The SAFE is one that, that folks are using, particularly out on the West Coast. Uh, you know, I won't opine you know, whether I think it's a great idea or not. I'm just saying that it's something that's, that's out there. Um, but the, the, the real value is, is that the transaction costs are so low, so if you're below 750, you don't want to spend a lot of your percentage of, of the round on legal costs, and this is an easy way to do that. Uh, the discount percentages, I, I had just mentioned 20%. That's actually probably just about the norm. It's usually between 15 to 25%. There's often an interest rate um, between 4 and 8%. And be careful about the interest rate, right? Because that's a, just an additional discount. If you start to play the numbers, it just adds to actually an, another discount, right? And then valuation caps. I get, a, I get a lot of questions about what should the cap be? How do you set that cap? All right, and I'm like, all right, you know, like, yeah, I, don't, I don't think anyone does a real analysis about what the valuation cap should be. And the point of this isn't that we do an analysis to see what the company's valuation is, right? Because otherwise, if we're gonna do that and we're gonna value the company, we might as well do an equity round, right? The point is to give the company a runway, a flexible runway and to pick a number. And so, you know, my, my thought, and I'm, you know, like, my practice is about 65% 
you know, company side, 35% investor side, so I am founder friendly. Um, uh, my thought is, is, that, is that at any point below 2.5 is probably too low for no good reason that you know, we see valuation caps much higher than that than the norm. Um, and you know, look, 150,000 on a $2.5 million cap, that's, that's a, a significant material amount that you're giving away. So what I see for early stage companies, and let's define early stage, you know, post, post formation, right? You have a product, maybe, maybe the M, you have an idea and a product, maybe the MVP is, is there or not, somewhere around there is about 2.5 to 5 million. Um, I've been seeing higher you know, uh, valuation caps in New York now, particularly if it's a data company. Um, and you know, if, if any of you working on data companies can talk about that, but we're seeing much higher valuations on, off of them at an early stage. And then the other exception is, is you know, former founders, folks that have done it before, much higher value, it, like, there's just, it's not even a metric, right? So they could just get a cap that could be 10 or 12 pre-launch. Um, and and that's, that's interesting. Uh, but you know, most folks aren't, aren't in that, in that um, in category. All right. So we talked before about this note that converts into this other round. Right? And now th the events that they convert, let's talk a little bit about. Right? The main event, the goal, everything that everyone's driving for is a conversion on a qualified financing. Right? What's a qualified financing? It just means that it has certain metrics, a certain imprimatur of validity right, to, to the market. So if I'm investing in one of your companies in a promissory note for $100,000, I'm doing a few things. Right? First of all, I'm saying we're not going to value the company now. Right? That's great. Second of all, I'm going to say I'm going to trust someone else to value the company. And off of that, I will take my discount, right? whether it be the cap or, 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 or um, you know, that 20, 25% discount, however, wherever you're going to land on. Um, and so if I'm doing that, I often want that round to be a real round. Right? I don't want you to just do you know, your uncle and it'd be you know, $100,000 from your uncle and you, know, you have a 15, you know, $20 million valuation on that. And you know, if I have, just have a 20% discount, all of a sudden, I'm like, whoa, what happened here? Right? I want this imprimatur of a real round. And does it, you know, how much money? So, so then you start to think about, like, how do we define that? Right? And you, you put metrics around it. Well, I know that if it's a million dollar round, you know, or if it's a $2 million round, or if it's a round led by an institutional investor, that it probably has had some ample, robust discussion about valuation. And it's probably the right call. So a lot of folks will say, look, and plus, I want to remain debt until the company has enough money where I know, you know, okay, that runway can continue to go. So, you know, you set these metrics and often, you know, you'll do a round and, and, and investors will say, if the round is of one or two million and it's from institutional investors, that's when my note converts into that round. And it gives the company the flexibility to take on smaller money beforehand without this stuff converting. Um, uh, sometimes you can convert, there's optional conversion at maturity, right? And this is what happens, you know, I had a conversation this morning about this what happens at, at maturity, uh, you know, and we don't have the money to pay it. Well, there's two options, right? If the company, or there's three, right? If <laughs> notes mature, a company doesn't have the money to pay it, right? You extend the notes, right? And, 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 and you push it out farther out. Um, the investors can sometimes negotiate a pre-set level, it's usually the valuation cap, to convert if they said, hey, you know, it's okay that you didn't do the round, we'd like to convert into common stock. I don't know why they would under those scenarios, but, but it is a metric that, that we use and it's available. So they can convert into this, um, into common stock as opposed to preferred stock at that same valuation, right? And then sometimes there is an M&A event or you sell the company before anything happens, right? And there we say, you know, typically you get, you know, some multiple of, your, your note or what you would have gotten if you converted at a discount. And there's one of those two things. And that will, that will happen. Um, so one of the things that, that we've talked about are caps. And I think caps are, are really problematic for companies. So um, we'll take this portion as a warning about setting caps, right? Because what happens is, is that, um, 
you get a $500,000 note, and it's a $5 million cap, right? You can walk through this. So it's $2 million investment is coming in now, and it's a $20 million valuation, right? So the valuation is, is, is four times the amount of the prior cap, right? And the amount of money is, is one-fourth, right? So on the conversion, the $500,000 note holders convert their shares at a quarter of the price, or 200% discount. Right, and it gives them as much ownership as the new equity investor. Right, and so if you think there's a problem, yeah, because the new equity investor is saying, I'm putting in my money for this ownership now, right, those folks put in a quarter of it and they're getting the same ownership. Right, and, and there's a discussion about what it ought to look like beforehand. And I can't tell you how many times that investors will come back, institutional investors will come back and have the founders renegotiate the notes. If you follow Brad Feld's blog or, or Joanne Wilson's blog, right, Gotham Girl and you know, Feld Thoughts, they've had an exchange recently about investors telling angels you know, to either reprice their early equity or their notes. And it's been a very robust, fun back and forth. You should check it out. It's just about this issue. And it's a warning about notes and caps um, because I do think that, that you know, companies use them so ubiquitously and so, and so <clears throat> so freely that you know you don't a lot of them don't do the mathematical analysis to, to sort of model it out at that next round and they don't know how they're mu much they're, they're actually giving away um, so my advice is that if you're going to have a cap take you know higher cap lower money all of this makes a difference on a weighted average basis into the next round so higher cap lower money starts to solve that Right. At above 750, I start to hate cap note rounds, right? Because you could have, imagine if you start to play this out, you know, with two million on a cap, on a five cap, and then you take on another, you know, two million later, you could have real issues, right? If your round is equal to the, to the note round. So you want to actually have a good disparity in the amount of money that's coming in on, no, on cap notes and, and in that next round, both the, both the amount of money and the valuation if you can. Um, I have an exhibit of the term sheet, but I don't think we're going to go through it. And, and this is all um, mishmashed a little bit. So um, stop there for a second because we move on to, to, to seed equity. If you guys if you have a question about convertible notes. There isn't. Um, it, so a little bit of history, right, uh, is, is probably relevant with respect to convertible promissory notes and how we got here. Uh, convertible promissory notes, when they started being used in the, in the emerging company context, I, I just converted an $80 million valuation. How can that happen? So as the founders and the entrepreneurs started to use them more, investors said, this is a problem. Okay, I'll let you use a note, but I'm going to cap it. And then what happens is that became ubiquitous, right? And then all the caps came out and this became this concept of using a, notes as a round as opposed to really a bridge into a future round with a known investor. And um, then we saw the problems happening, right? Because now it's opposed to the problem where the investors, um, the company is just using all of the, the promissory note proceeds to, to create value of the company and converting the investors at a much higher valuation than they expected. You know, now we're seeing, well, there's a disjunct between the new money that's coming in and what preference the investors might get or the note holders might get if they convert at this cap. And so it's a different problem. Um, I think we should move away from convertible promissory notes pretty much entirely or at least really limit them to the context in a certain, in a certain amount. When I work with my clients, I really don't want them to issue pr convertible promissory notes with caps. It, certainly anything above 750, and you know, I try to steer them toward you know, 500 if they're going to do it for the first round. Um, but if not, then we look toward pricing that round. And there's ways to do that um, that, are, that are easier, more efficient, and avoid these, these later stage battles. Because what the note does, right, it starts ramping up the credit card, and then you know, when it comes due and you do the analysis, you're gonna have a, uh, you often have a problem with your new investors. Um, so seed equity, uh, 
again, early stage equity, you've all heard of preferred stock, right? Or no, have you? Okay, so let, let, let me step back. Um, two types of stock in general that a corporation can issue. A common stock, right, basic common rights preferences, all that other stuff, and a preferred stock, right, preferred rights preferences and all that other stuff. Generally, the preferred stock has a preference on liquidation, meaning that the amount that you paid for that preferred stock, right, you can get that back first if the company liquidates at a lower value. Um, there's also other rights, right? Often there's protective rights that come along with the preferred stock, right? We're investing two million in, in, in a preferred stock of the company, and because of that, we have these protective rights, the thou shall nots, the company will not issue a senior security, you know, liquidate, dissolve, do an M&A event, um, change our security, right? Amend the charter, all sorts of things that, that investors in preferred stock will ask for in order to protect that investment, that sort of gets rolled into this, this uh, preferred stock equity round, right? If you're looking at a later stage company if, at the alphabet series, right, A, B, C, D, E, these things are fulsome. You can take a look at the NVCA.org, right, the National Venture Capital Association, um, has a set of model documents, and you can look at them, and they're pretty fulsome about, about the rights and the preferences that go back and forth. The series seed, is a, an acknowledgement that those big docs are a little too much for most companies and that the promissory note is not enough for most investors, right? And so it's somewhere in between is meant to be a very simple streamlined approach to issuing equity and pricing the, the, the valuing the company at a, price, at a price per share, right? So um, the advantages, um, and, right, so, you avoid, this is the main one, is you avoid the cap issue. Um, you're gonna structure your investment you know, right now with an eye toward future rounds, and typically you'll be able to take more money on. A lot more investors are gonna, you know, you're, you're at a different market for the seed investor than you are the early stage note investor. A lot of investors that are my friends won't invest in notes, but they will invest in, in seed equity. Right, some of the disadvantages, the real, dis there's really two. Um, it, one, it sets the valuation of the company, and we talked about that before, because the disadvantage is setting your valuation early, is that now your option pool has, has value, and that's reflected in the options or the restricted stock that you issue to your employees, right? And then um, the other thing is, is that, that you know, it's gonna cost a little bit more, it's gonna, the transaction costs are gonna be higher, but it's because you're gonna give away ownership and control and more so than you would in, in, in a promissory note. You may give up voting rights, you may give up board rights, um, you may give up pro rata rights to invest in the next round and things like that. Um, and those are usually the, the typical terms of a seed equity, right? Dividend preference, voting, liquidation preferences, conversion and anti-dilution. I'll just talk about that a little bit. Um, in a second, the board of directors, right, we've talked about that. Seed investors, $2 million round, probably gonna say, hey, we want this board to now go from one to three and we want one of us on it. And we wanna be involved and we're gonna have six to eight meetings a year. I usually think that's a good thing for companies um, because they need that influence, they need that, need, they need that help. Um, and then the protective provisions and stockholder veto rights, we've talked about that, those, the, those shall nots. Um, conversion and anti-dilution, so this concept of anti-dilution comes up in a preferred stock, um, and you may see or hear it, so we'll discuss it you know, fairly quickly, because it's a simple concept, right? Anti-dilution occurs in two ways. One is, protection occurs in two ways. One is mechanical, right? So if I have a share of preferred stock that converts into one share of common stock, and then you do a stock split, right? And every share of common stock becomes two shares of common stock, Right, the preferred stock should be convertible into two shares now, right? Because we, we can't just com split one and now not change the other. So these are these mechanical adjustments that work the preferred stock, and that's fine, that's normal. But there's another one too, right? And that's, that's anti-dilution protection in the form of purchase price protection, right? So I sold you a share of stock in Nuco for a dollar, right? And I, I go out in two weeks and I sell a share of Nuco for you for 80 cents. You're probably pissed. Right? And I might have violated some sort of disclosure. Right? So what happens? There's a mechanism 
that says, look, we're going to give you effectively of the price per share that she paid, and we're going to adjust your conversion ratio. Instead of one to one in common stock, maybe you're at one to 1.1 in the common stock. And the way it's done, there's two ways it's done, one of which is just never used, and I don't really want you to think about it. That's full ratchet. It goes to the exact price. But the way that it ought to be done is on a weighted average basis, right? Because if I sold you 100,000 shares at a dollar, and I sold you one share at 80 cents, it doesn't make sense for all of your shares to be 80 cents, right? What's the actual effect on the company of the one share for 80 cents over there? And how does that work? And so there's a mechanism and a formula that we use to convert that. But the point is, um, to take away from this, is that one of the rights the preferred stock will have is that you can't issue below our price. And if you do that, we're going to get converted. Are there exceptions? Yes. Exceptions to employees, service providers, consultants, some M&A, strategic stuff, and other warrants and things like that. Um, but these are going to be the typical terms of the preferred stock. That's one of them is a purchase price for protection. Right. Okay. And I won't go through the, 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 uh, the term sheet of a seed equity, but we'll stop there for a second. Does anyone have questions about doing an equity round, whether it be discussing with the investors, the valuation, um, the type of the stock, the length of the process? Well, the convertible note is the debt option, right? That's one, uh, that's one debt option. Um, you could just do a, a pure debt financing, um, but it's, like right, but, the, but you're not going to be able to at a very early stage, right? You're going to have to show, a bank is not going to give you a line of credit until you show sort of some history on the business um, and some revenues. Uh, it's very tough to get. So the debt option for early stage companies is, is, is either promissory notes from founders that are, are you know, loaning, company, loaning their company money and they intend to get it back in a later financing um, or you know, friends and family are just pure debt. You can do that. The question is, you know, can you sell that? And most investors, other than you know, your friends and family, will want an instrument that converts into equity, right? The only reason you're investing in an emerging company is either I really, really love the founder and want to help him or her, or I think I'm going to make some money, right? And so, you know, if you're an investor worth your salt, you're thinking about in, at this at, in this vertical, you you want equity, and I want to price that early, and I want to, you know, ride it with the company and grow. When, so when I invest at the early stage, I'm, I, you know, I, my philosophy is to bet on the jockey almost always, right? There's the jockey, there's the horse race, and there's the horse, right? The horse race is kind of the industry, the vertical, what the company's doing. The horse is the company itself, right? It's product and stuff like that. The jockey is actually the management team. Um, you know, at the very early stage, what I've seen is that a lot of folks have great ideas, right? And and um, most of them think it's the most unique idea they've ever heard of. I've probably seen at least 10 to 15 that are the same or similar and, and why they failed. And you know, what I've come to realize over time is that founders have certain characteristics and successful founders um, have certain characteristics and, and you, you look to pick those out, right? And what they're doing. And so I look for you know, betting on you know, thought leaders in the space, um, dedicated founders that are working on this full time um, I can always answer the question, why is this founder doing this company, right? Not a real estate investor that's doing a social digital media platform, right? It's doesn't make sense to me. How are you getting smart on that? How are you a thought leader? Those are all of those things. I also think about, you know, what the company's market is. You know, these are, these are all things that, you know, you think about how large is that market? Is the company's product going to be able to be different and unique in that market? Will the management team draw enough insights and data to be able to, to evolve in that way? What's their process of doing that and how have they thought about it, right? And so uh, when I see a clarity of thought and a clarity of vision and a ton of enthusiasm, um, you know, and particularly if I see your prior successes, 
I, you know, that leads me to want to invest at the early stage. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so how do you choose and, and, and you know, advantages, disadvantages, when do you do that? Like, a lot of it is stage specific and a lot of it is, is who you're talking to. Right? You know, if you have an investor that says, I like only equity and I'm going to give you a million dollars, you're not going to go back and say, well, I'd rather do this as a note. Take that, close that deal, and go. Right? Um, when you're deciding for yourself and deciding what to do, and I often tell founders, you know, depending on their, the stage and inflection point, we'll give you two term sheets. Right? They're both very simple. They're two to three pages each. Right? And you can just pull them off and every firm has their form of them. Right? Um, and you can take a look. And this way you're armed with this idea of one of the other um, and a lot of them will move toward a larger seed round um, but they'll find that it's really hard if it's pre-launch, right, pre-revenue to get that seed round and they could spend eight months looking for it or they could spend one month and do a $250,000 convertible note round and build a product to a MVP which they can then go out in a longer round. Now, the downside to the founder is, and they always tell me this, is like, well, I don't want to do this again. This is a pain in the ass, right? I can't keep raising money. Like, yeah, but, you know, founders have, you know, what, three different, uh, a founder has, has three obligations, right? The first is to not let the company run out of money. The second is to not let the company run out of money. Can you guess the third, right? It's to not let the company run out of money. So, so you're going to have to, you know, pick and choose what you'll do. And sometimes, you know, if, if it's easier to raise that smaller amount, that's why you see folks going right to that convertible promissory note, because it makes sense to, to, to get those investors that are on the hook, take that money in, and then use that money to build toward a bigger, bigger round. So hard to, to get out of the box if you're not an exited founder in your second company get out of the box and get a great valuation with a lot of money from, you know, without spending a year of time pounding the pavement. And then, it, you know, if you have a, a, a nimble, small management team and one of you is doing that and the other is doing something else, you know, like working on the product, you know, you have 50% of your resources that are on product when it should be really 100% um, because that's where you're going to get the value from and that's how you're going to do it. So a lot of it is, is, you know, understanding where the stage is, how, you know, how long you're going to need to, um, you know, how long you're going to need to actually go out and, and try to get that raise. Um, and, you know, if you can raise something very quickly. Another thing, by the way, you know, not, not, not to be understated is timing. Um, like, for example, if you formed three, four weeks ago and are thinking about doing a seed round before the end of the summer, I tell you, forget it. Right? It's sweltering outside, it's hot, and VCs and <laughs> institutional investors, they're going to be out in the Hamptons, they're going to be out Sand Hill, like, they're going to be other places. And so, you know, you might be better off if there's a downturn, like, take in that money quickly and move on and do something else. So great times to, you know, start, you know, I tell my founders, and, you know, if you're looking to look to do a round in Q3, start having warm discussions. Part of you know, my, uh, my other, one of the other series, uh, The Perfect Pitch, you know, one of my, my directives is to pitch warmly when you're pitching. And what that means is that, you know, you don't, you, you never date, you, you, never, you never marry someone on the first date, right? And so investors are never going to say yes to an investment on the first <laughs> meeting. So you get to know them a little bit beforehand, get to understand them beforehand before you have this discussion where, you know, I would like you to commit to invest in my company. So you pitch warmly and you do that. And if, you know, if you're looking at a Q3, Give yourself three, four months of lead time and actually getting to know some investors, talking about them, to leading up to that point where you're having that discussion, right? And, you know, and along the way, you may get some note investors and angel investors. That's kind of how you'd stage that out, right? So, you know, we can go over this again. Convertible notes or equity. The notes, we delay evaluation. The cost is a little less expensive, right? Very fast. The founders maintain control. The disadvantage is, is that, you know, you have a maturity date, it's debt, debt, it's 18 to 24 months. There's often a, um, an interest rate cap. If the cap is too low, it creates a windfall for note investors um, and chills future equity rounds. I wish something would chill right now. <laughs> but um, investor preference, you know, some of them refuse to use notes. I've had investors that I've talked to, friends, they're like, look, you know, I do this for a living. I can, I can price the company. I can value it. And they won't use that. Equity. On the other hand, 
right, advantages. Investors can get board seats, um, a buffet of rights and, and provisions. That could be a disadvantage to the company, right? It avoids the cap issue. Um, and it's more money. Typically, you're going to put more money into the company and do this round, right? Um, the cost is a little bit more. Uh, the company has less control. That's the disadvantage side. And you value your equity pool, right? Um, and so those will be kind of, you know, the advantages and disadvantages. Um, again, sometimes it's just going to be stage specific about where you are. And, and the market is going to dictate what you do, right, uh, often. You can try, you can have a best case scenario. It's about lining up what, what you, you, your ideal would be. And then when you're presented with anything less than the ideal, you know, adjusting from there.